Hello and welcome from the Autonomous Machines World 2017 here in Berlin. I'm here with Nick Eyl from Hyperloop One. Hi. Hi Nick and welcome to the conference. Thanks. First of all, I would like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and your background. Yes, yeah, so as you say, my name is Nick Earl. I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Field Operations at Hyperloop One. What does that mean? Essentially, I run all the projects for the company worldwide, and Hyperloop One is the only company that's actually built a working Hyperloop. So this morning you already held a keynote presentation right. on the topic building the raging standard for autonomous mobility. Yeah. Can you give me a few more insights into what you what topics you covered? Yeah, so at the keynote this morning, we called it the range, as you said, the range extender for autonomous mobility. And the reason we did that is when people think about the Hyperloop, first of all, it takes a while to get your head around it. Say, wow, what an you know, exciting project. But then they think, oh, it's about moving from A to B very, very quickly. And what I was talking about this morning is, well, that's certainly true. London to Manchester in 12 minutes, for example. I talked about... Stockholm to Helsinki in 28 minutes. But what, but what it also would do is it would allow people and freight and cars to travel inside the tube. And the analogy is that the digital internet, data packets, voice packets, video packets. So I, I talked about what if you wanted to take a move from a hotel in Amsterdam to a restaurant here in Berlin. That would be six and a half hours by road uh, at a good time of day. You could take an Uber, an autonomous car, or a driver, Uber, let's say it was autonomous, take it for the first two, three miles from Amsterdam, go inside the Hyperloop tunnel whew, to Berlin, come out, you're still in the car, and then go to your restaurant. So the idea is you could get from, in this case, Amsterdam to Berlin for dinner in 18 minutes. That's like a range extender for autonomous cars. So what if autonomous mobility was anywhere to anywhere, literally anywhere to anywhere, because you could use drones where there aren't roads, then it would be like the internet, it'd be like Wi-Fi. Universal, ubiquitous access to autonomous transportation, but of physical things, not digital things. That sounds very exciting indeed, uh, which brings me to my next question. What are the main milestones you would you wish to have reached with uh, Hyperloop within the next five years? So the, the main milestones uh, for us as a company was, first of all, we had to form as a company and raise money. We've, we've done that. Secondly, what we then needed to do um, was actually build the technology, not just talk about the technology. There are other Hyperloop companies who have great slides. Uh, we've actually built one, and I showed it today at the conference. We have a, a system uh, in Nevada, just north of Las Vegas. So we've done that milestone. The next big milestone is to start with a project in a country, a country that wants to move forward, very key, that want to move forward, because there are some countries want to move forward very quickly because they want to leapfrog. So we have a few projects around the world, and the first stage when they say they want to move forward is to work with the regulator to get a safety certificate. That's what's really key. There are no regulations for a Hyperloop. We've got to co-create them with the regulator. Then we've got to do the safety tests and get a safety certificate. Once we get a safety certificate, there'll be regional EU safety certificates, Middle East safety certificates, North American safety certificates. But once we get a safety certificate, then we can start building. And you know, as I said this morning, there's over a million kilometers of traditional rail track, which essentially as a technology was invented in 1830. So we think there's huge potential here. And what do you see as the main challenges associated with this Hyperloop project? So obviously there's the technical challenge. Um, we've, um, uh, we've got one working, as I've said. We've still got to create the software platform as well as the hardware platform. I think we have to build interoperability into it because you don't want a closed system. I'm from the networking world. I was with Cisco. A closed network or a closed system is, is not very good. It should be open. I think there's the regulations. I've talked about that. But I also think there's the, frankly, the public perception. People say to me, oh, Hyperloop, wouldn't your face peel off? And I say, well, no. You know, you go on an airplane, stationary, accelerate 0.2 G, go at 600 mile an hour, slow down, stop. That's what a Hyperloop does. The only difference is we bring the low air pressure down uh, to the ground so we don't have to go up in the air. But your face doesn't peel off. 
um, in an airplane and your face wouldn't peel off in Hyperloop. But we do have to do a lot of awareness and uh, a lot of education of the public because this sounds, wow, it's new. Everything was new once. The car was new once, the train was new once, the airplane was new once, and now Hyperloop's new. That's some great insights. I just have one, look, one last question from my side. Uh, what are your impressions from the conference and your main key takeaways from today? So what I thought was interesting, uh, obviously I, I wasn't sure what the conference was going to be like when I arrived here and I was the first speaker on, so I wasn't sure how other people would present their offerings, but I've, the ones that I've seen so far are really interesting. So the very um, uh, technical overview of what you need to do to build safety into the software platform from the gentleman from CERN, very interesting. And then the, the presentation I saw from Rolls-Royce on autonomous ships, that's very interesting as well. But perhaps the real benefit for me so far has been the quality of the people that I've met um, in the coffee break. And after my presentation, certainly had a lot of people wanted to do one-on-ones. That people are very, very interested uh, in what this would enable. I mean, for example, I just finished with one last example. I talked on stage about the fact that with Hyperloops, you could do same-day delivery, well, actually, coast-to-coast -coast delivery anywhere in North America in five hours. You think about that. If you could take a person or a parcel or a car to anywhere in North America in five hours, what would change? Well, th then suddenly every business in North America has access to Amazon Prime capabilities from a public utility. Transport system systems are public, not private, utilities. So a pizza shop in Chicago could deliver a pizza in, in less than an hour to a consumer in, let's say, Denver or San Francisco. That changes everything. You don't need warehouses, you don't need as many trucks, and it totally disrupts supply chain in a very similar way to the digital internet has changed everything. So I don't think we're talking about transportation systems here. I think in a few years' time we'll look back and talk about physical disruption of supply chains enabled by Hyperloop, just as business processes have been disrupted enabled by the internet. Bottom line, this is physical broadband that we're building. It just happens to be a transportation system. Well, thank you very much for the interesting insights, and I wish you a great rest of the day here. Thank you.